with that, we are going to jump back in to our sermon series. If you've been with us um, for a while, you, you may recall last year we began a really ambitious sermon series as we began to preach through the book of Romans. Um, I, I mentioned it last year, uh, perhaps a few times, that some of my pastor friends kept telling me, like, why do you hate yourself? Why are you doing this to yourself? Do you know what you've signed up for? Preaching through Romans is a hard thing. There's a reason why many churches actually just preach sections of it, um, and yet you're going to preach through the whole thing. Yes, because, as we've shared, the book of Romans is considered like the cliff notes of the Bible, in that if you actually understand the, the entirety of the book, by virtue of that, you gain a perspective on the totality of Scripture. And so we are a church that wants you to know the Word of God, to understand the Scriptures, to confidently be, open, to be able to open the Bible on your own and know how to uh, interpret it and apply it and teach others. And the book of Romans is one of the most incredible books that allows us to grow in our faith. And so we're picking up where we left off. Uh, you can go to our website and hear the previous, uh, see the links for the previous sermons. Um, we're in Romans chapter 8, and we're going to spend time today on verse 26 to 28. And it says the following. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that we can gather under your lordship and we pray that you would meet us as we go to your word, speak to us, open our hearts and our minds. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you desire to reveal Jesus to each of us, to glorify him. We pray you'd uh, meet us, fill us with yourself, illuminate the word of God to our hearts. And we thank you, Father, for the grace, the mercy, the kindness, the love that we always find when we turn to you. We pray you'd be with us, meet us, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, um, how many of you have ever visited Boston? Um, you know, that's, that's a tough city to say out loud in New York. Um, there, there's a deep rivalry there. Um, uh, you know, and I'm going to say something that um, maybe you may take away some of my New York cred or say uh, he's, he's, he's betraying us, but... I actually think Boston's a lovely city. I think it's amazing. Um, even as a New Yorker, I'm not ashamed to admit that. I think it's a great city. It's also an interesting city in that if you notice in New York, um, it seems like there's like no rules when it comes to development. Like, you, like you'll have a KFC here, luxury high rise here, housing projects here. Like it's just like, who's making these decisions? Nobody's just like, roll the dice and just like, you wanna build something? You wanna go ahead, everybody build something. In Boston, they actually have somewhat of a plan, and it was interesting because it's not like this in New York. There's center city Boston, kind of where all the history, and, and that's like the closest feel to Manhattan. Like people are in somewhat proximity to each other. There's a close space. But then there's like this outer ring, and there's like neighborhoods like Lexington um, and these other neighborhoods that there, you're not like crunched up. They actually... There, the kind of the way they, they parceled out the land and kind of the, the, the way they architect the way, uh, what they were going to allow people to build, there the houses are on like large plots of land. There's farmland, there's like estates. Um, and, and there, that's where people, families have owned homes for like generations. Um, and so there's, there's like old, old families, historic families there. Um, that date back some for like hundreds of years. Um, and for whatever reason, God always kind of surprises me. I found myself at a, at a farm there. It was a, a gentleman that attended a church that I was speaking at, and his family had this farm, and they, they bought it, 
and uh, like they passed it on to them. And on this farmland, um, they had this barn. And but it, the barn didn't look like a regular kind of, I was like, there's something here. I had no idea what was there. And I'm a guest, so I wasn't going to be like, hey, what's there? Um, and so I was so happy when he invited me in. I'm like, all right, what's here? Come inside and realize this guy actually was an inventor. Um, he had prototyped, like, wheelchairs, um, um, Baby strollers, like he just he had invented a number of things. One thing that he invented was really moving. You know when someone is in the hospital and they're on their on a bed and and they need help, they, there's that like thing that they can hold on to and they push that button, right? And then it alerts the nursing staff to come. Unfortunately, when when the elderly uh, as they're, sometimes the sicker they become or they become weaker, they can't even do this. And there's actually like a, a, a concern, a health concern that at the moment someone is too weak to call for help, it actually means that it's time for hospice. And the moment they're sent to hospice, typically it means whatever time they had left is about to be shortened. And so this guy, because his, his wife was a pretty significant nurse in, in hospitals in Boston, he became aware of this. And he said, this is tragic. There's some folks that arguably they might have more time with their families if only there was a different way for them to call for help. So he invented this thing that didn't require someone to use this muscle. It actually just rested in the palm of their hand. And, and most people, even if they were frail and weak, could just do this. And for some of these folks, it gave them more time. Some of these folks never went into hospice. They actually got better and they went home. And I thought about that. It's hard to wrap your mind around because some of us were young and, and maybe we haven't experienced a, a family member or a loved one have been in the hospital, seen someone toward the end of their life. Imagine being so weak that you can't call for help. Imagine being so weak that you can't even press your thumb down to call for help. Weakness is a really difficult thing to embrace, to face, to wrestle with, to name, to admit to. Um, it, we, we're in denial, so many of us in our world, where we don't want to face the realities that in life sometimes we'll face these moments where the best description is we feel weak, we feel frail, we feel feeble, we don't know what to do because uh, we don't have the ability within ourselves to rise to that occasion. What's fascinating for me when I think about weakness is that Romans 8.26 says something very profound about you and I, and it tells us that we all have a weakness. And this weakness might be surprising to us. The weakness we're told that we all have is that we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. Now, why that's surprising is because as we've been studying Romans, we were told previously that we had another weakness and this weakness was we were too weak to save ourselves. We could not rescue ourselves. We, we were in this state that the scriptures called sin and we're broken and the life of God is outside of us and we're desperately needing to be made alive by Christ. And, and every attempt that we try to do, whether we try to earn our way out of this ditch, whether we try to do anything we can to receive, nothing helps. We're weak, we're unable to help us. And yet the good news of Jesus is that he has rescued us. He's come to our aid. He's, he's brought us out of the pit. He pulled us out of death into life. He has met us in our spiritual weakness and now in Christ, he's credited to us his righteousness. We're made alive because of Christ. We have this new glorious identity of, of people who have been called children of God, where we have a seat at God's table and this seat was not achieved. It wasn't earned, it was received. And now we're finding out that not only were we too weak to save ourselves, 
now that we have a relationship with God, we're finding out that we actually are still too weak. But now our weaknesses, we don't even have the strength to talk to God, to commune with him, to pray, to walk with him. And we find ourselves weak again, needing rescue again, needing God's help. Now, now think about that. What, if we take this as a whole, the scriptures are telling us not only are we, t- we were too weak to save ourselves, but now that we've been saved, we're too weak to sustain this relationship on our own. But what does God do? It says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. What's our weakness? We don't know what we should pray for as we should, as we ought. This is a weakness that we all share. And for some of us, hopefully that is like, that's taking like guilt and stress and you're feeling like less alone to hear. Maybe you thought you were the only one that struggled to pray. Maybe you thought there was something wrong with you or deficient in you. And maybe you weren't mature enough. And why is it difficult for me to pray? And now what we're realizing from God himself to us, letting us know this is a weakness you all have in common. We all struggle to pray. We all struggle to maintain our end of the conversation with God. God is not uh, struggling to talk to us, to, to lead us, to commune with us. He's always trying to reach us, to speak to us. It, you know, if you want to know God's will, know that he will make sure you know it. Because uh, he is nothing but ambitious to, to pursue us and to make sure that we know his plans for us. He's always speaking to us. And yet what we're finding today is that when it comes to us responding, us maintaining our end of the conversation, we struggle. Have you ever tried to have a conversation with someone who clearly did not want to have it with you? Isn't that fun? Where it's just like, I thought this was tennis, but you are not serving the ball back, you know? And so, it's like, so how are you? How's everything? Okay. Oh, okay. Let me try this. Oh, are you new here? Did you grow up in New York? No. Okay. Um, oh, I, I see you, you have a cup of coffee from, oh, do you like that coffee shop? No. Uh, and, and, and you just keep trying, just like, I, I want to talk and there's nothing coming back. Like in some ways, this kind of the picture that we're being drawn here is that God has rescued us for relationship with him. And yet we struggle to maintain our end. But rather than feel defeated, alone, shamed, this is what God says. I not only rescued you from your inability to rescue yourself but now I'm gonna rescue you from your struggle to pray. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. He helps us in our frailty. If you're struggling to pray, hopefully now you know you're not alone, but hopefully now you also are realizing God is telling you and I that he wants to help us in that struggle. That prayer is kind of being redefined for us. Prayer is an experience on our end that's riddled with weakness, riddled with frailty, and yet also drenched in God's help. Prayer is this this space that we find ourselves when we're trying to commune with God and we don't know what to say, we don't know how to say it, we're struggling to maintain our end of the communication with God. The Spirit comes and says, I'll help you. I'm going to help you. Now, part of the challenge for us after we know that, or even before we know that, quite frankly, is just to admit that we need help. You know, in a city like ours that is kind of defined more or less by expert culture, everyone thinks they're an expert, right? Um, And most people have gone to very established schools and, and tried to get advanced degrees to prove that they deserve people's attention because they can contribute in whatever kind of industry they're in from a level of expertise. In that kind of a culture, it's hard to admit 
that maybe you don't know what you're doing. A friend of mine, he was recruiting for these startups um, that he was working with. And so the, um, some people don't like this term. Um, it's called headhunting. And so I have a friend that's a headhunter. And he was like, I don't like when people say that that's my profession. And I was like, okay, then tell me what you do. He's like, well, I kind of hunt. Ah, you said hunt. And so um, he's like, I look for professionals and I try to line. All right, whatever. And so he was looking for professionals to fill this, these, these roles in these startups. And he's meeting with this young guy. Um, and he was actually on the campus of MIT. If you don't know MIT, there's a lot of very, very smart people there that um, historically have attended that were very smart, advanced society in different ways, technologically in all sorts of ways in business and finance. Um, and he's there, he's recruiting folks, he's interviewing and this guy's sitting with him and he's looking at this resume and he's confused about this work experience thing. And he's like, hey, tell me more about this job. And the guy's telling him and he's like, mm, he's being vague. He's like, he's not, and he's just asking more, asking more. Because on the, on the paper, it had a bunch of things that he did, but they were like not clear specific. And the title of his job in this moment, and it was a brief job, it was during the summer, so that also glared like, wait, you just worked here for a few months, and so what happened? Why did, did you quit? Did you get fired? The title of his job was Petroleum Technician. And as he kept probing, is it? and then finally the guy admitted, he said, I pumped gas. That's what I did. For the summer, I went home and I worked at a gas station and I pumped gas. And he was like, oh, so this is what you were defining as a petroleum technician. Oh, okay. What, what, he struggled to just admit that he didn't have a lot of work experience and that for, uh, it wasn't a shameful thing, but in that context, he felt shame to admit that one of his only jobs was to go pump gas during the summer when he would go back home. When it's difficult to communicate our weakness, the, ch the spiritual challenge becomes is that unless we're honest about our weakness, we won't be ready to receive God's help. That the help that the Spirit wants to give, we won't receive because we're not ready to receive it because we struggle to admit, I need help. If you're struggling to pray, as we all do in various ways. Let today be the beginning of a life of honesty with God and say, God, I need your help even to pray. I can't even do that on my own. I need your help. And thankfully the scriptures tell us that Jesus has made a provision for us. The spirit helps us in our weakness. How does he do that? How does the Spirit help us in our weakness? Look at what the Scriptures tell us. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for, as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know, um, it's always a funny thing, and uh, the way our church is kind of structured, the second service, the service, is typically um, attended by folks who are either single or who are married and don't have kids yet. Um, and it makes sense. The first service is where we have all our programs for kids, and so during that, that service, it's a ton of families and, like, single people that don't need a lot of sleep. And so they're just, they, they come to their earlier service. And so... Um, but years ago, I remember uh, there was someone in the second service. It was such a funny interaction. Because um, you hear, like, I talk about my family quite a bit. Um, and so this woman came up to me and she was like, like kind of sheepishly because she was afraid of what I might say. And so she was just like, uh, does your family attend this church? And I was just like, I was so confused. I was like, yeah, of course. And, and, and she's like, I've, I've never met them. I've never seen them. I was like, oh, you go to the second service. Of course, you're never going to see them. They're always in the first service. Um, and then I realized, like, for some folks in the uh, second service, like, my family is a myth to you, you know? It's just like, it's like, you know, they exist, but, you know, you haven't met them. We're taking his word for it. Um, 
You probably have heard at various points me talk about our fourth child, Brielle, who was born with Down syndrome. And it has been one of the most amazing experiences that we did not know God had in store for us. Um, raising her has been absolutely different in the most beautiful of ways. Um, I was catching up with a friend who uh, I've known for many years, and he knows about Brielle, and um, like, I'm, I'm one of those dads, if I'm talking to you on the phone, I'm like, wait, 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 and then show the camera, you see her, you know, like, I just, I love her and stuff. So he's seen her, and when we were talking about our kids, it hit him when he asked, he said, um, you know, how, how, how many words does Brielle say? And I said, um, hmm, yeah, I, I think probably, like, legitimately we might be able to claim that she says two words. Um, sit and eat. And I saw his face, like, drop as it hit him. And he said, wait a second, she's never said mama? I said, no. She's never said dada? I said, no. And it rocked him. And I'm watching him get rocked, and I'm like, we're having two very different experiences right now. I'm, I'm like, absorbing this, and, um, and he says, Chris, I'm going to have to sit with that for a bit. I didn't realize that. And what, what it occurred to me afterwards, it was like, I've never felt like Brielle didn't talk to us. Because I know how to interpret her groans. I could tell you what a whimper means. Well, she's thirsty. I could, if she's in the living room and I look away for a second and I hear her say, oh, her toy must have fell. Find it. Uh, I can tell you when she needs to be hugged. And she has this amazing, amazing gift. I, I'll be rushing out the door, ready to go meet someone or like, do something for the church. And she will literally stop right in front of me, raise her hands basically like saying, you're not going anywhere. You're stopping right now, and you're going to give me a hug. And she just needs a little reset, and there, just hold her. And then she starts wiggling, saying, I, I'm enough. You know, like, just let me go now. And then uh, she wants to go about her life. And what, what, in this moment, what my friend realized, I, I've never felt like she didn't talk because I understand her groanings. Her, the words that she's not saying, I understand them. And when I think about what this scripture is telling us, it says that the spirit helps us in our weakness for we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Sometimes we think prayer is you and I sounding religiously eloquent that we don't categorize something as prayer unless it has a few these and thous and saith, and it sounds King Jameth, and, um, and it has to have four verses of scripture in it and before it to be considered prayer. And, and have you ever noticed, this always cracks me up, where some folks, the way they pray is very different than the way they talk to people. Like, you'll talk to them like, hey, how are you? And then all of a sudden when they start praying, oh, God, like, like real different and just like, you know, you don't have to change. You know, you could pray the way you talk. And, but anyway, that's a different conversation for a different time. Um, the Holy Spirit helps us in prayer. It says he prays groanings. That what if prayer is far less sophisticated than we make it to be? What if prayer from God's perspective is, let me just hear your heart and you don't even have to use words because I could tell you when you're sad and you don't know it. I can tell you when you feel anxious. I hear your anxiety even though you haven't said a word. 
we're so caught up and it has to sound a certain way and it has to be sophisticated. It has to be religious sounding. And here we're told that one of the ways the Spirit helps us in our inability to pray, he intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words that even when we don't have the words to articulate what we should be praying for and how should we be praying for it to begin with, the Spirit helps us by interceding for us and through us with groanings. What I'm coming to realize is that some of the more profound moments of prayer I didn't think were, were moments of prayer. But from God's perspective, he heard me probably more sincerely, more authentically than the times where I was trying really hard. Because in those moments, the pretense was gone. The, the, the desire to sound religious and sophisticated was gone. At those moments, all I could do was, oh. Jesus, because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to say it. I didn't know what I was feeling. Can you relate? How, have you ever had the experience where you're just angry and you don't know why? You're just, maybe you're sad and you don't know why. Have you ever seen the feeling wheel? It, it's honestly one of the most like humbling things. When I look at it, I'm just like, oh, there's so many feelings that I never give myself permission to feel or to say. And, and then when I look at it, I'm just like, oh yeah, I forgot about that one. There's sadness, yeah, that's right. Or anger, and, oh, that's what, it, it, there's so much that we feel and we don't often give ourselves permission to vocalize, to, to own. And what we're told is that one of the ways the Spirit helps us is by groaning through us, groaning for us, praying words that our human wisdom couldn't fathom. They're too deep for words. What a God that we serve, that, he, that rescues us from our weakness to save us, to save ourselves. And then once he saves us, helps us in our weakness to be able to even talk to him. He says, I got you. My spirit's gonna help you in your weakness. But look at what else God promises to us. He not only promises that the spirit's gonna help us in our weakness, that he's gonna groan for us and through us. He's going to meet us in our inability and in our weakness and our frailty. But verse 28, God gives us one of the most glorious promises, I would argue, in all of Scripture. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to to his purpose. Let me read that again. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. How many consider themselves like a good photographer? Like you, that you feel like you have skills. Like if you, if someone in, in the crowd says, oh, I, can anyone take a picture? You're like, I'm here, you know, like, <laughs> like you push people aside. No, 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 they, they, they're going to mess it up. I got you. And you grab the phone and, 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 and maybe you've done some amateur uh, photography. Like our city's amazing to take photos of uh, the people as long as they don't see you and then attack you, you know, like, or the buildings. Um, there's so much to take pictures of. But have you ever seen someone... Uh, use the panoramic view. That always cracks me up, especially in Manhattan, because someone would be like, and meanwhile, there's like people walking in front of them and stuff. <laughs> it's just like, they're, they're, but what's happening in that view? They're trying to not just capture what's in front of them. They're trying to get a view that sees more than their limited perspective. Like if their eyes could capture something, the panoramic view captures all of it all at once. It gives you this fuller view. In Romans 8, 28, when it says, and we know 
that for those who love God, all things work together for good. That word all things in the original language, it's the word that we derive panoramic from. So hear what God is saying. He's saying that one of his promises to us is that the panorama of your life, your life from beginning to end, what is way behind you and it's probably no longer in your view and what you can't even imagine to see in the future, what's beyond your limited ability to see, God says, I see the whole thing and my promise to you is all things will work together for good. All things. Everything you and I have ever experienced and yet to experience, there's a promise that God gives us and he says all things will work together for good. Like if we're hearing this and believing this, this is like one of the most amazing blank checks you could ever be given. Just like all things, even the bad things, all things, even the confusing things, all things, even the disappointments, even the things that I can't even fathom how anything redemptive can come out of this, all things. Wait a second, even when I mess up, no, because I could get it, God, that you, you're, you're gonna make everything work out the things that people have done to me. I understand that because I had no part to play in that. And so they did me wrong and they betrayed me. They talked about me. They, they turned their back. Okay, I can trust that you're gonna uh, use all of that and turn it for good. But even when I mess up, your addictions, your frailties, your bad decisions, my bad decisions, all things, he says, he will cause to work together for good. Now, if you have had a pristine life, and very few of us have, I would say none of us have, but some of us maybe are still thinking we had one. But if you're here and you know the depths of despair, you have walked through things that you don't even want to think about. There's some things that some of us have gone through that we won't say out loud in a room by ourselves. Those things, the hidden things, the shameful things, God says, all things I'm gonna cause to work together for good. All things. Nothing is wasted in the hands of God. Uh, let's be clear. When God says he'll use all things, and that means he'll, he could use a bad thing, a negative thing, and he'll use that for good, that's not God saying that all of a sudden that bad thing is now good. Betrayal is still betrayal. Hurt is still hurt. People mistreating you is still people mistreating you. This is God, this is not God saying, I'm going to whitewash over what's evil and, and make you, cause you to think that it's all good. No, he's saying even the things that are categorically evil and bad and broken, even those things I will turn around and use for good in your life. And in mine. If you and I actually believe this, this promise from God has the power to revolutionize any human life. Because to believe this gives you the unique ability to go through some really horrific moments in the present and not falter in your faith because you know, I trust the God who said, I'm gonna cause all things to work together for your good. See, for us, I, you know, I realize that for some folks, especially if you're not a follower of Jesus, and maybe you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus and you're kind of skeptic and you're looking in and you're hearing this, this may 
like strangely sound like, like uh, the Christian version of positive thinking or like positive self-talk or this is like us manifesting or whatever word you want to use these days. But here's the difference for us. When you and I could walk through valleys and trials and fiery situations in our life and we don't know what good could ever come about it, we can stand firm and say, I don't know how this is going to be good, but I'm trusting and I can trust confidently that God will work this out together for good. And you could say that sanely, credibly, with integrity, because the evidence for you to say that is the cross of Jesus. At the center of our faith is something that on the surface, who would ever think that that could be for good? Who would ever think that a crucified Messiah could actually be for good? That it could actually be what the world needs? That it could actually be the redemptive thing that could turn everything around? And yet, that's at the center of our faith, this act of God that says, I have the ability to take the most heinous, horrific, tragic thing that history has ever seen, creation crucifying its creator, right before our eyes, the sinful, coming against the sinless Messiah and murdering him. Who could ever think that something even remotely redemptive could come out of that in the short term, but eternally redemptive? It's mind-blowing. And yet, this is the God who tells us, I will work all things together for good for those who love me and those who are called according to my purpose. Here's what that frees us up to do as we prepare to close. It frees us up to not feel the pressure to put a, put a bow on everything that happens in life. Sometimes things are bad and they're just bad. And no matter how much positive, you know, nuance we try to, it's just bad. It's painful. Rejection is rejection. Um, hurt is hurt. It's just bad. Disappointment is disappointment. Losing a loved one is losing a loved one. Struggling um, in, 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 in all aspects of life, it's still struggling. It's, it, it, we don't have to put a, like, a twist on it and, and act like it's not painful and it's not difficult. I, I see this so many times, especially with Christians. Like, we've developed, like, this kind of weird self-talk where it's like, how are you, brother? I'm blessed. And it's just like, all right. That's like, real aggressive. You know what I'm saying? Like, are you angry, too? Because, like, why do you have to shout at me? It, but it's one of the things that we struggle sometimes uh, to just admit, I'm sad. I feel lonely. No, I feel isolated. No one understands me. I'm hurt. I feel disappointed. This promise from God frees us up to be the most realistic people the world has ever seen, but also the most hopeful. Because we could say, though things are dim right now, I serve a God who says, the panoramic view of my life will one day be described as good, as everything working together for good. You may not know why you sustained that injury. You may not know why you grew up in the family you grew up with and ex experienced some of the pain you experienced. You may not know why you had to go through those difficulties at work and why those relationships fell apart. You may not know why in the moment. And it's okay to say that's hurtful, it's painful, it's confusing, but it's also okay. Actually, it's more than okay to say, but I trust that God will work all things together for good. And, you, and if you're asked, how do you know that? I serve the God of the resurrection. The empty tomb of Jesus tells me that even the most broken moments of life, our God has an ability to redeem. In this Easter tide season, as we keep reflecting on the resurrection, 
one of the most powerful ways you and I could walk in the reality of the resurrection is to speak this promise over us and says, I know that all things will work together for good because God has promised so. Can I invite us to stand? In these next few moments, as we respond to God in prayer, in confession and worship, I want to uh, invite you if you would like to receive prayer, if the words that were shared earlier resonated and you would like to receive prayer, if the message kind of is provoking you to get prayer or you just need prayer in any way, shape, or form, the prayer team is in the back and they would love to pray with you. All you have to do in these next few moments is slip out of your seat, go in the back, and they would love to greet you and pray with you. But at this time, could I invite us to let's turn our hearts to God Let's turn to the Lord in worship and faith and trust. Father, thank you that we can admit that we're weak. We can admit that, that not only were we too weak to save ourselves, but even now we're even too weak to maintain our relationship with you, to continue to respond to your voice and to your leading but we thank you that the spirit helps us in our weakness even now begin to ask the Holy Spirit for his help say Holy Spirit help me in my weakness help me in my weakness to pray meet me in my prayer time Meet me in my life of trying to commune with the Father. Help me in my weakness. Admit your weakness. Receive his help even now. And maybe you're here today and you're going through a season in life where you're really struggling to believe that the panoramic of your life will be good. But right now, God invites you to stand on the empty tomb of his son to look at the cross and say the God who turned that around for good promises me that all things will work together for good. Help us to believe that. Let's worship him in these next few.